Yes, in fact, brother, I wrote a song just for you I want to play for you. You mind? You mean during the course of this program? Like or? right now. You mean you want to do it right now? Like right now. You wrote a song for I, who? I, huh? You know those set-free tapes you turned me on to? These right here? Yeah, while I was in my motel room, me and Doc kind of got did we know? I, did I know you were going to do this? No, sir, you didn't. I didn't know he was going to do this. Did I? No, sir, you didn't. You sure you're supposed to do this? Oh, yes, sir. All right. You know the prince of the world? Well, that old demon, he's heartless. He had me walking in chains. He had me blinded by darkness. Then I met the sun. There was a dawning of truth. And I've got something better than the fountain of you. <laughs> found out you were an illegitimate child, that your mother had been raped, mm -hmm. and had a lot of pain, but you really found some deliverance. But did you ever go and deal with that aspect with your mother and, and find out some things and have a kind of a healing experience in your relationship with your mother? That didn't this? happen really to this year. I mean, you know, we had communications, Christmas and things like that, but there was always that wall. Yeah. And in 1991, you know, I've always been a songwriter, but never a book writer, and God gave me the idea for the book, Illegitimate Question Mark, But I Have a Father. And I said, Lord, I'm not a book writer. But he said, uh, oh, yeah. And so it was to April this year, 5 o'clock in the morning, God woke me up and said, it's time to start that book. So I go to the computer like a big book know-it-all. <laughs> and I start, uh, type, 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 and I get frustrated. I said, I don't know what to say. And my wife said, well, you know, Mike, you had not even called your mom, really even talked to her about it. And mm. I was just going on things that I'd heard. So I called my mom, and this was all in one day now. I called my mom, told her I was starting that book, told her I wouldn't use our real names, if that would make her feel better. But I said, Mom, you never really told me what happened to you. And I'll tell you something, James. That day, God broke the dam wall and the floodgate. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. She, she opened up and she shared, and, and she started getting free. I could hear it in her voice, and she said, You know, I was going to call you today. And I said, You were? She said, Yeah, I was. She said, Your dad's moved back to town. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, Oh, this is the man that raped my mom. I said, Well, how do you feel about that? Well, it's all right. It, it don't really bother me I anymore. But uh, said he, he's got lymphocytic leukemia and said his dad had it and he wanted to make sure the kids were checked. And one of the first things hit me, I wonder if he knows Jesus. And then a light went off in my head and I thought, what a privilege. I said, Lord, you got to let me do that. And there was a thing that says, what would be a bigger privilege for me than to lead the man that raped my mom Jesus Christ? And I've still got that goal, brother. He's, I'm supposed to meet with my dad. You know, my father raped my mother. And she conceived at age 41, gave birth to me. And, and later in my life, my mother wanted me to have my real father, to be my father, so she married him. And I actually divorced him and married him, I was told, five or six times. 
and it was not a good thing. Uh, when he came into our home, he was an alcoholic, and uh, he would uh, go into a drunken rage and nearly kill my mother. In self-defense, I nearly killed him. And all of these things that, that happened were awful. But one time, this was after I started sharing Jesus with people in public ministry, Michael, my father, <clears throat> came where I could, could try to help him. And the, the truth is that one day I was driving down the street and I saw a man laying in the gutter by the curb. And I was in, in junior college at the time and preaching. And I pulled my car over and I walked across the street and dropped down and by the curb and I rolled this man over to see, you know, if he's all right. And when I rolled him over, I looked in the face of my own father. Oh. My dad had fallen in a, in a drunken stupor. And, and there he was. And you know, Betty, remember I brought him home. We lived in a, in a trailer, in a mobile home. It was, it was 50 by 10. You remember Robin, Rhonda's little bed filled the whole room. Where her bedroom. <laughs> that was it. It was a cubby hole. That was, that was her little bedroom. And our bed wasn't much, uh, bedroom wasn't much bigger. Uh, and, and we just lived in that little trailer. But I took my father, my real father, alcoholic father, to my house. But I could not let him go in the house. I had to put a big chair out in front of the trailer and let my daddy sleep in that chair mm. while I tried to help him. You say, why didn't you take him in the house? He's your daddy. Because I could not trust my daddy with my little girl that was about two years old at the time. That's a terrible thing to say, but I couldn't. But Michael, I tried to help my daddy. Mm. And one day... I went over where I'd gotten him a room to stay, and my daddy had thrown up all over his shirt from being drunk. And I knelt down on the bed. I mean, the man was stinking. He was just filthy. He had paid somebody to go buy him a drink, and they brought it to the room. And he got so drunk he couldn't walk. <clears throat> just threw up all over the sheets. Now, you got to understand, and you can, but this was tough for me. I knelt down, and I reached over, and I pulled that, that man's body that filthy man who had thrown up on his own clothes. And I held him and I looked in his face and I said, Daddy, I don't know you. I don't know you, but I love you. I love you. And I lowered my head and I began to cry until my tears fell on the floor. And I said, Daddy, I want you to know Jesus with all my heart. And he did walk down an aisle with me the next Sunday morning and make a decision. I know the tendency here would be to applaud because that's what I wanted everybody. They did applaud in the church when my old drunk daddy went down the aisle. But Michael, my daddy, never changed. He wouldn't even follow the Lord in baptism. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't. There was never a change in my daddy. And I witnessed to him the last time, one week, before I came right here to the football stadium, here where we are. There's a huge football stadium near here. And I was speaking in that stadium when I got a call the next week that my daddy had died in his sleep. I don't know where my daddy is. I have told people many times <clears throat> that when I get to heaven and I see Jesus and I see all the believers that I have this hope, it's faint but it's real, that as I see Jesus, that out of that crowd of people around Jesus, there would just be a figure that would begin to wave a hand and say, hey, son, look here. And it would be my daddy. And that my daddy would say to me, the night I went to sleep, before mm -hmm. I went to sleep, I looked up toward God and said, God, I never did anything right. But I want you to forgive me. Let me tell you how great our God is. My daddy never got to do one good thing for anybody that we know of. He never did anything for his son that I'm aware of except break my heart. But without ever getting to do one good thing, the God that sets us free and the God that loves us is so great and merciful that he would have reached down that night and said, Joe Bailey Robinson, I write your name in my book tonight. I could see my daddy in heaven. I'm praying that you'll win your daddy yeah. and you'll get to see your daddy him, have heaven in him right here on the show. I'm going to see him, brother. That's my prayer. That's my prayer.